exactly that. And from London, joining us today is Sanaf Safi, a journalist from Afghanistan for whom the personal has truly become political. Sana works for the BBC World Service. She's presented a daily TV news bulletin, World Right Now, to an audience of 7 million Pashto speakers since 2014. She was born into communist Afghanistan and remembers the civil war of the 1990s and describes losing her childhood to Taliban rule and then reclaiming a sense of freedom only to see that being snatched away again. Her 2021 documentary, Afghanistan and Me, paints a stark picture of what female journalists in Afghanistan can expect as the Taliban resumes control of the country. Sana, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Mira. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Let's start by asking you, firstly, how you are and how your family are at the moment. Is everyone safe? I'm well. Uh, my family is doing well at the moment. Uh, they're in Afghanistan. Uh, yes, they are safe, but I haven't had uh, much contact with um, many members of my family. Um, it's because we're still being very cautious. Uh, some of them don't use uh, mobile phones. Um, if they don't have access to encrypted chat apps, we don't use mobile phones. That's just for their safety. Thank you. I'm really, really sorry to hear that. And I do hope that you can be able to communicate with them soon. Tell us a little bit of how it has, the last year has been for you as a journalist and how your work on the world right now has changed or and what in fact has stayed the same. You know, how do you see your role at the moment, both within the BBC and to the audience as you serve? The last year has been really difficult, really intense, uh, very busy uh, for Afghan journalists in particular for journalists everywhere but for Afghan journalists in particular it was very busy year uh, for me specifically it was a mix of um, workload combined with the emotional um, roller coaster that I found myself in um, and also the family aspect of it so it was um, one of those few months that I don't want to repeat. Um, so it was very, very difficult um, because as a journalist, my responsibility is to tell, uh, my primary responsibility is to tell world stories to Afghan audiences and Afghan stories to Afghan audiences. That is my job on the BBC Pashto uh, TV. But I also have another added layer to that, which is I am a, biling a bilingual journalist. So I'm expected to tell Afghan stories to world audiences as well, um, uh, So, it, which is the reverse of what I do on a day-to-day basis. And telling a home story to world audiences is slightly different while everything was happening around me. Um, while I was busy dealing with family, with friends, with the contacts that I've known for, for years and, and just ordinary Afghans. So it was uh, several dimensional or the, the, the stress and the intensity uh, was uh, coming from several dimension. And it was very, very hard in that sense. Can I kind of delve into that a bit further? Because it's a really interesting idea of what a foreign correspondent is and what a foreign correspondent can and can't report. And there's a very traditional perspective that you can't report on your own country because you are considered, you know, too involved in the in the situation on the ground, especially in conflict situations. But on the flip side, that, does, that doesn't apply, of course, if you are kind of a British or American journalist reporting on your own country. And also crucially, people who speak the language, who understand what's happening on the ground, who have connections on the ground, can obviously tell the story um, with more verisimilitude and, and uh, credibility. So in this situation, given that you work for BBC World, how did you feel um, your colleagues and your newsrooms and then uh, colleagues in other organisations felt about your work? You know, were, were you treated as kind of a domestic reporter reporting on the ground just to an international audience, or were you seen as part of the foreign, foreign press corps? Um, I think I, the, the impression I have is uh, Afghan journalists who are either based in the West or in an organization like the BBC, 
they're seen as the, the experts really on the story. And, and they are the experts on the story because they speak the language, they have the contacts, they interact with people on a daily basis. So even when a foreign journalist, a foreign correspondent is working on a story, they would come to us and say, hey, you know, we're, we're considering doing a story, let's say on the south of Afghanistan, um, this is a subject matter and this is what we're trying to do. What do you think? Do you have thoughts? What are the considerations? It's, we, we're sort of experts, but also cultural advisors as well as other advisors. Um, so in that sense, we're not really foreign correspondents, but we are people from the country who have far more expertise to, to, to contribute to a story and make a story better than it would be. If, um, I'm not saying completely if we were not there, but, but I think it adds something to it. But I agree with being too close to the story. Even when I do something on Afghanistan, I always ask my editors to give me somebody who is completely new as a producer or somebody who is, um, who is helping, who is working on the project. And the reason I ask that and the reason I say that is because I'm too close to the story. I need somebody very detached to say, that makes sense. That doesn't make sense. Why? Because they look at it from a very fresh perspective. And even when I was working on the documentary, one of the first thing I said was, um, can I work with a producer who is completely new to this to the story? And they were uh, they said, yes, of course. Um, and I think that is the strength of having um, that kind of an arrangement, because you end up having a product that is that is. In, full of empathy, uh, tells the story, but also it is slight, slightly detached and doesn't confuse the audience. Um, you know, it, it, you listen to something and you you come away from it. And certainly, that's that's what I've had the feedback um, in regards to the documentaries. You listen to it, you come away, and you say, "Oh, that was good. It wasn't too emotional. It wasn't too um, blame game. It wasn't." Uh, to victimized, uh, but I also understood something. There was a story there, and I and I felt that I now know more about Afghanistan than I would have done if it was like a two minutes package or something. So I think it's the strength of having the two. That's really really interesting. Can I can you can you think of any any examples from the documentary where you framed something differently or added something or took something out uh, on the basis of these conversations with your producer? Um, it was, I mean, there were a couple because we, when we were making the documentary, we, um, the producer and I, um, uh, Craig, uh, the producer Craig Smith, uh, we uh, spoke at length before recording and we did the recording over several days, but for two, two hours. So altogether it was six, six hours of recording from me. And then there were obviously things that I, um, said that didn't make sense I'm sure because it was six hours of recording right and at times I was very emotional um, but the real work came after we gathered all the material and when it when it came to editing and scripting it uh, there were things I remember there was a specific uh, word I'd used for um, when I described the Taliban um, not the Taliban, the uh, foreign, uh, the Western-backed Mujahideen uh, elements or, or individuals who were fighting against the Soviet-backed regime in Kabul. And I'd used a word when I went through the script again and I said to Craig, I said, oh, that's not right. I'm being too emotional. I'm taking, you know, these were, yes, these were pe people, but the way I'm describing them, it doesn't make sense. And he said, yes, of course, you know, when we were recording it, it just made sense because we were at the, in the moment, but um, in the edit, we had to go through the script again and remove that. Um, so it's, it's things like that that really help when you have a fresh perspective. From your perspective, I know this, the, the last few months, especially if the summer are not ones that you'd ever want to repeat, but what did you think about the kind of the international broadcasting of the story? What was your perspective on it? Again, is it the story you would have told? Would you have told us something differently? Well, the international, 
uh, aspect or the way the Afghan story was told on the international media um, was not one that Afghans would have wanted because the focus was on the withdrawal, first of all, on foreign troops. Then when Kabul did fall on August 15, the focus was on the airport, while the rest of the country was dealing with um, arbitrary detentions and uh, killings in, in different parts of the country, revenge attacks, uh, people losing lives and livelihoods. Um, if you ask an Afghan, they would say, you know, that was a distorted uh, version of what was happening. Uh, it was an important aspect of the, the story, but it wasn't the whole story. Uh, for Afghans, it was their country that fell to a group that most people fought for 20 years to get rid of. And uh, again, on the international stage, you know, money was spent, uh, blood was shed there from, from NATO and coalition forces. Um, so for Afghans, they wanted a holistic approach. They wanted the world to know where it started, how it started, how it was going and where it was ending up. But the version you got from uh, the international media was Kabul fell to the Taliban and Afghans didn't fight, um, which is, again, not true. Uh, for the past 20 years, um, thousands of Afghan security forces died because of the fight. Um, even, I mean, my own, my sister's brother, uh, my sister's husband, sorry, was killed in 2019. Uh, so, you know, Afghans continue to lose lives and livelihoods, but yet the narrative on the international stage was the same that, oh, Kabul fell because Afghans didn't fight. Uh, so for Afghans, it was, it was a very disappointing um, way of telling the story. But then there were journalists who really went above and beyond and, and tried to tell the story in a way that was fair um, to all sides. And that was giving the audiences something that they wouldn't have got otherwise. Um, one of the examples I can mention is Liz Dissid's podcast series, um, A Wish for Afghanistan. That is something that you can all listen to. It's available. Um, she interviews Afghans on different sides of uh, the political aisle. And um, it, it really is, is a great piece of journalism. The same with uh, another lady that I would really want you to, to follow her work is Azamat Khan. Um, she has done some brilliant work on the civilian cost of the, the war in the last 20 years, not just in Afghanistan, Afghanistan, but in Iraq as well. And another person that I would really want you to, to read uh, is Emma Garrison from uh, um, The Guardian. She has done great work on Afghanistan, particularly on how women see the takeover, but also be even before the takeover, what the situation of um, women was, and, and even still she's following stories. Um, so yeah, there are great examples, but uh, obviously, you know, in, a, in a, such a big story like Afghanistan, I'm sure there would be things that people don't agree on. This is absolutely vital. Um... Can I ask you, you I, I've noted, and I, I, I'm not surprised at all that you mentioned kind of female journalists in your reporting, in your kind of recommendations, and we'll, we'll come to that because I think this is a kind of topic that I really want to look into, but the audience perspective, you mentioned get, giving the audiences what they need. You have been speaking to the Pashto community for, for years. Do you feel, what do you feel your connection is with them? And since last summer, certainly, do you feel the relationships of trust and kind of, the willingness to be part of a community, has that changed? And if so, how do they still trust you as journalists? Yeah. Uh, one of the feedback I get from my community is that um, um, people who, who see me somewhere, let's say in a party, they say, oh, Sana Safi, yes, we know you, but we don't know you. And the reason is, they know me through social media, but they don't know, know me personally and what my politics are and, and who I was. And that was partly 
um, slightly by design. When I came to the first of all, I grew up in Afghanistan in different parts of the country. So I don't have a strong locality where I can just say, hey, I'm from Birmingham, for example. I can't say that because I'm not from a, a one location. I lived in different parts of Afghanistan. I spoke um, with different communities and I was immersed with different communities. Then I left Afghanistan when I was 18. So I came to the UK um, at the age of 18. I had to work on myself, but also try and, and um, get a job and study and all that. So I was busy with myself for, for, for a while. At the same time, doing stories. So my relationship with the, the Afghan community was always through um, social media, um, the internet. And it was very, very, how would I put it? It is a very close relationship, but also a detached one. Mm. What I mean by that is that when I come home, my relationship with the Afghan community is only through my work. When I come home, it's just me. Yes, my family is Afghan and they're still in Afghanistan. Some of them are in different parts of the, country, the world. But my inner, inner space is just me. So it's a very detached relationship, but also one that I care. I care about the Afghan people. I care because I know the, their language. I know their feelings and I know what they've gone through. And so there is empathy. Um, but not emotions, if that makes sense. Yeah. And I think they see that because I'm not there to take sides. Afghanistan is a diverse country. Um, it is multilingual, multi-sectarian. It's, it's uh, multicultural. Um, I know what the country has been through and I know what those people have been through. And it's not my job to really focus on one community, not the other, or feel more empathy and sympathy with one or the other. So. I have, yeah, and I think that that's the best way I can describe it. And that's what the feedback I get from the people that I meet. Um, thank you very much. And I'm sorry about my dog that is kind of complaining in the background. Um, this kind of relates, there are questions from the journalist fellows about this, and in particular, your role as kind of narrator in your documentary. And so you're, you're kind of straddling a role that's both narrator and impartial observer. Could I ask if this is feasible? Morton, do you want to come and ask your question? Good morning. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for... Do uh, sit down? Okay, sorry. Um, I just have uh, one, one question for you. Um, it, when you uh, report your own story as a reporter, it gives you a certain set of challenges. That's just one thing. Which part did you find most challenging here reporting your own story? Yeah, that is, that is a really good question. And it's an important question because again, with a story like this and it's so intense, it's so, it's big it, it is full of emotions and there are so many personal aspects in there. It was hard. And I, I would say all of them were challenging. Um, I don't have one particular area that I would say was far more challenging. Um, but I would say when I was talking about it, I, yes, this, I, you know, I lived in Afghanistan and those things did happen, but I had never talked about those stories with anybody um, over a few days period continuously. Yes, I may have I may have spoke about some of the events that I'd seen or heard with the friends, family or contacts here and there. I may have just mentioned one or two examples, but I never spoke about start to finish. And that was the hardest because I think when you when you talk for six hours and after that you listen to the raw audio, you go through it and you say, oh, my God. I'm so, I've been through so much and you can't help but feel sorry for yourself um, because the focus goes from the story to yourself. You're like, yeah, I was so young and th these things happened. And then you have to take a, a breath and say, hang on a minute, this is not about you. This is about the country, but also you're part of a very huge story. This is the story of most Afghans. Um, and I think that was the most difficult part. Um, 
for me in particular, when I was listening to the to the raw material afterwards, um, it just felt a bit too much. And one of the worries that I had was, is it too exposing? Am I exposing too much? Um, am I making this story about myself? Because I really want to tell the story of the country. It's not about me. I know these stories are common and each and every Afghan um, has gone through something similar. Uh, so that was one of the things that I always had at the back of my mind to the day when it went out and after I received feedback. I was worried about that. And I think that was probably the challenging part. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think this is some, this kind of, a few people have asked that question, but how, you know, when you put yourself and your voice and you literally hear your voice speaking, how do you not react emotionally? Mm -hmm. And um, I think you're right, you, you, you do react emotionally, but it's what you, what you do with it and what you present later. Thank you. Can we talk now about the kind of issue that was raised about the issue of women in um, and women journalism in the status of women in journalism, but all in Afghanistan, but also in particular the role of female correspondents? Because from my perspective, you're absolutely right. Some of the most outstanding reporting has been done by female correspondents um, at a time that women's rights in Afghanistan are being um, quite systematically dismantled and eroded. What do you, not, I'm not asking you to predict the future on this, but how can the international community and how can Afghan journalists, the Afghan journalism community help support women um, in journalism in this space? Mm -hmm. I'll start by saying um, what is happening in journalism in, in Afghanistan. And from what I'm what I've been hearing uh, from journalists on the ground, they're saying that there is a slow death of journalism in the country. Why? Because um, out of 600 outlets, 240 or just below 250 um, have been shut. Thousands out of a population of 10,000 uh, journalists um, thousands have lost their jobs. A female, the number of female journalists before the takeover was uh, about 3,000 people. And now only hundreds of them, or just a few hundreds, under 500, I would say, are still going to work. They're still working, a female journalist. The same with male journalists. journalists. The total population was you know, 10,000, but now there are just under three or 4,000 people still active. You have a funding issue. So yes, there is um, the international sanctions. Then uh, in the past, um, media outlets were supported by national and international aid that has stopped. There were individuals who had their own outlets. Um, some call them strongmen. Those are no longer there. Uh, because their outlets have been stopped by uh, the new regime because of the fact that they were seen as polarizing or individuals who were just using their own money to, to fund a media outlet. But overall, funding is an issue, and that has led to the, the, the shutdown of, of media outlets. Then you have um, female journalists not going to work because, the, because of the fear. And because of the new regime's rules that are, have been imposed by the media. So the rules are vast and vague in general, but mostly it's to do with um, the work of men and women in one office, um, the, the way women are dressed. So they're required to be in full hijab. By full hijab, don't show hair. Uh, i.e. wear the clothes that is um, not showing your, your hair. And it has to be modest, so yeah, um, modest clothing. And um, if, if, you, if, you, if you ask women not to go to an office where there are men, so there is strict segregation of work, you know, sexes, it, it's making it difficult for people to operate. You can't have two offices, you can't have two separate rooms for some, so, so that that's automatically preventing women from pursuing their jobs. Um, and then it's the fear because women, those who remember the previous Taliban regime, they just automatically assume that 
Um, it's probably brutal if they go out of their homes. They do not want to come across a situation where they're stopped on the road or told where you're going or searched or um, humiliated. And then you have the, I talked about the economic pressures, but, but the Taliban pressure as a whole, everything has to be within the Islamic structure, the Islamic framework. And that's very, very problematic for most media workers because they don't know what they mean by that. Um, you know, you can easily get into trouble and most people don't take that risk. So that's what's happening at the moment. Um, great work uh, has been done by women, that is true, uh, both nationally and internationally. Women have been at the forefront of uh, most of the developments, um, I would say, even the protests that are happening at the moment are by women. Uh, women go out on the street every day demanding their rights, and those are covered by, by everybody, but mostly female journalists are in touch telling those stories. Um, how can women journalists be helped? Well, funding is number one, obviously. Uh, if, there is, if there is a scope to support female outlets and female journalists, then great. Um, another, another one is to uh, a way to work with the current structures that are there, um, because most female journalists that I've spoken to, they're saying, well, if we can't, if we can't have a, if we can't have a role in the current media landscape, then maybe we need to start something that is female owned inside the country, but we need funding and that has to be funded by somebody independent. Uh, on smaller smaller scale, uh, I would say if you can mentor a female journalist, then that would be another way. If you can support them in whatever way uh, to tell their stories, but also to give them a platform so they can tell stories. If you have a, an outlet and a publication, so that would be another way to do that. But many Afghan journalists were evacuated to um, other countries across the world. If they can be given opportunities to tell Afghan stories, then that's another way of addressing the problem. Uh, but none of them are going to be enough because the country needs an independent media. And at the moment, that is uh, slowly, slowly uh, disappearing. Absolutely. And yeah, and it, there isn't a really obvious solution um, for this. I'm going to go back to the room and go to Haya at the back there from Palestine. Your question. Are you there, Haya? Um, your story holds so much pain, but at the same time, I felt a sense of hope at the end of the story. Um, I wanted to ask you um, what would you say to the girls who are still trapped in the reality that you had as a child right now in Afghanistan? Uh, what words of, of advice would you say to them, and what sense of hope could you give to them? Did you manage to hear that question? If not, I could repeat it. Uh, thank you, Haya. Just the last part of it, but if you can repeat it, that'd be great. It's a, what, what words of advice and sense of hope could you give to the girls of Afghanistan? Yeah. Who are um, in the days that you were in when you were a child? Yeah, and Haya is referring to the ed education because would, girls uh, are banned from secondary school at the moment. Um, they don't go to secondary school because the Taliban have, they have not said anything publicly, but we do have stories and cases of, oh, it's because of the funding, we don't have enough money, that's why we have told them to stop, or it's because of cultural reasons, we don't want to provoke backlash. It's, it's, so there are too many stories in, in regards to why uh, female secondary school uh, students are not allowed to, to school. Um, what word of advice? I would first of all say that um, 2021 or 2022 Afghanistan is very different from the 1990s Afghanistan. When I was growing up, the world or Afghanistan was completely cut off from the rest of the world. There was no internet. There was no outside connection. There were just Taliban and that was it. Now we are in a far better situation. The world is connected. Afghanistan is, yes, uh, internet penetration is very, very small, but still it is connected with the outside world. 
uh, the Afghan diaspora in the West and across the world is, is far bigger than, than we had in the 90s. Um, the, the, the power um, is there by, by power. I mean, they, you know, they have the political, social, socioeconomic powers in, in, in outside the country that they are. Um, and also there are initiatives by Afghans themselves um, to come up with solutions. Uh, be those initiatives in the form of online schools, um, underground schools in the country that are happening, that I'm aware of. Um, people are busy working on that. But also there is, an, there, is a, uh, there is work from the international community as well to find a solution to the problem. But I would say that one of the, one of the advice I would give them is do not waste your time just find anything whatever that is if it is a, a, a book club or um, you coming together to do your homework at home just do it because the time that you have right now is far more precious and important and don't lose that I'm not I don't think this situation will continue forever there will be a solution, but this time is really, really important. And just use that um, in whatever way you can to better yourself. So once the situation is ready or once the country is ready, according to the Taliban, then you would not be left completely behind. But there is hope, I would say. It's not completely hopeless. Thank you. And again, just staying on this issue of how to support women and women journalism, Shubrova from Bangladesh, do you want to ask your question there? Um, yeah, I think we spoke a little bit. I basically wanted to ask you what you think the future will look like for female journalists in Afghanistan. And are there any processes or systems being put into place um, on the part of the international community to kind of give them the protection or the safe spaces that they need? I'm not aware of, uh, of an organized um, top-down effort at the moment uh, from the international community, but I do know organizations who are trying to help in their individual capacity. Um, there are some organizations who are trying to come up with a plan to perhaps create a hub for journalists in exile, the Afghan journalists in exile, so they can tell the stories of Afghanistan, uh, but also have a home and a space where they can share ideas and, and um, their work and their projects. There are some other gen initiatives that are trying to help or fund um, journalists who are still inside Afghanistan, but those are small scale efforts. Um, but I would say is that it has only been five months. And I think uh, to be fair, it's five months is not enough um, for, for people to come up with some sort of a, 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 a long term plan. So if there are if there are initiatives, if there are plans, uh, they're yet to be announced. Um, but I think we can we can do something on the international stage um, that we haven't yet done. And I'm hoping uh, there will be uh, more news about that in, in the coming months once we know more. Because at the moment, the focus is on the humanitarian situation because the country is suffering from a severe humanitarian uh, catastrophe uh, because more than 20 million people are said to be on the verge of starvation. And all the effort at the moment, all the attention is on how to avoid that uh, because uh, the majority of those victims are going to be women and children. Um, so that's the focus at the moment, but um, we will probably see initiatives in the future about how to help journalism and journalists. I'm on this issue of what's happening on the ground in Afghanistan. How easy are you find are you finding it from abroad to get a sense of what's happening on the ground? And in a way, how sustainable is, is it? You know, because what you're talking about really is much of the journalism is going to have to be done by journalists in exile because it's just simply not feasible for them to do it from 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 Afghanistan. But 
at some point that, you know, the connection can be very strong at the beginning, but as time and distance grow, the connection grows weaker as well. I'd be really interested to know how you kind of navigate this and what your thoughts are. Yeah. At the moment, I can see the difference in my uh, on my groups. So we had I'm part of uh, several groups that have between 200 and 250 people on each one. Uh, uh, they are human rights groups, women rights, journalists and, and um, other people who are active in different parts of the country. And I've seen that they have gone quiet uh, in, uh, since the takeover. And they used to be very active, but now uh, things have died down. And that is, again, I would say, because most people can't afford to have the data, the Internet data to be connected. And that is a problem. Uh, some people are switching everything off because of the fear. They don't want to be found out. They don't want to be communicating with people outside. They don't want to be saying something that would get them into trouble. And um, on the journalism aspect, uh, people, uh, obviously organizations are shut and there is no money and there is no, um, in that sense, it, it's hard for people to be connected and, and be active. So it's very hard to do journalism. And most of uh, the much of the journalism that I've seen, it's done uh, via private uh, networks. What I mean by that is, is, yes, I'm part of this group of 230 women. And um, if there is a story that I'm really interested, then I will call them personally or message them because I know them. Those are my contacts. It's not because... Um, something is available so that that requires you to do the extra work um and then you have to take give them the time because some people do not want to speak to you or there is worry there is fear um and some of um uh, other the, the other aspect of the journalism at the moment is the the, the videos that were coming out the citizen um, journalists who are just recording videos of either atrocities being committed or human rights abuses being committed by different actors, but mostly the, the, the Taliban are blamed. Um, and, and that is what is circulating on social media a lot these days. And then once they come out, then the international, the international media pay attention and other media who is based outside the country, they pay attention and cover those stories. But most of, yeah, everything is done on, I would say, networks, okay. uh, individual networks at the moment, because there is no big scale news gathering operation um, that you might expect in, in a different scenario. And this presumably then leads to kind of huge potential for misinformation as well, if it's being done through these private networks and videos without, they can't always be sourced. Absolutely. Verification is a huge problem um, in regards to these videos that are being circulated because the videos of these atrocities are not just from Afghanistan. So you, you may come across videos that were recorded in Syria, videos and pictures uh, recorded in other conflict zones. And now people are saying that, oh, this is Afghanistan. And the verification of that takes time because you have to find the right people, you have to you know, make sure that you don't, you're not putting anybody in danger, but also um, ask the Taliban for a, for a response as well. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, the Taliban are very, very media savvy. But when it comes to the verification of videos and social media user generated content, they do take their time. And sometimes it's not easy to reach them for a response. Tell me a little bit more about what you mean by a media savvy in this case. Is it big that they're willing to speak to journalists or they're willing to put out their own information? What does it mean? Well, for the past 20 years, um, there was a saying, actually, that the Afghan government was so slow that as soon as you ask the Taliban for something, they would <laughs> send you a message on WhatsApp or just send you a reply or send you a, a, a statement. But the Afghan government took hours and even days sometimes to get back to you on a, on, on a matter. Um, the Taliban, what they'd done is that they understood fairly early how to manipulate the message and how to really get across your message. 
even to this day, the spokespeople, they're very on point. They're very succinct. They want to tell you exactly what they want to tell you rather than give you what you want. Um, they have always been that way. And um, they have a communication in several languages, not just Pashto and Dari, that are the official languages of the country. So they have English, Urdu, and I think they have Arabic and some other languages as well. Their social media users are very active on social media. Um, when there is something that uh, is seen as anti-Taliban by their followers, they would storm in that thread or that conversation and um, really debate the issue. Um, they also have, uh, I wouldn't say supporter, but they also have individuals who would be seen as um, not apologists, but, but individuals who argue a case that could be interpreted as, oh, that's quite pro-Taliban or that's, that's quite pro. In the past, it would, have, it would have been considered as, oh, that's quite pro-Taliban. But now that, you know, now that they're part of the government, they, they, they know how to use media and how to get their message across. Thank you. I'm going to go back into the room um, to Meraj, who um, is from Kashmir and has a huge amount of experience in, again, reporting from a very dysfunctional state. Meraj, do you want to ask your first question, actually, about kind of who gets to tell the story in these instances? Because it kind of follows on from what you've been speaking about. Um, hi. So um, when I was listening to the documentary and you recounted some details of your childhood and your family and the sense I get, and please correct me if I'm mistaken, the sense I get is that you come from what uh, one might describe as the traditional elite of Afghanistan, urban, relatively well off, educated, liberal. And uh, because of that, do you get criticism that because of that position you have in the society, you are speaking on behalf of the masses whose worldview, whose interests may not align with yours? Do you get such criticism? What do you make of it? And how do you deal with it? Mm. That's a good question. And um... But I would correct you on um, just one point. Afghanistan is, yes, it's a very, it's very diverse and it, it, it has layers of, of people. It's not class-based society. Some would describe it as tribal, but I disagree with that. It's not tribal in that sense either. But there, there, are, there are differences. Some are urban, some are rural. Uh, but if you go by the statistics, then 70% of the population is, is urban, rural. Um, they still live in, live in the countryside. 30% of the population is urban. And then again, um, educational opportunities were bigger and, and more in, in city centers than they were. I, I, I would slightly dispute my background, but yes, I agree with you that I, the, fam, the family that I came from, they, they were educated. They were, um, they were not, I wouldn't describe them as rich in that sense, but they were, they were modest. They came from, the, I mean, to this day, I have family both in the center, in the in urban centers, but also rural. I would say far more of them are. Um, living in the countryside, they've they've always done, and I think the the way things work in Afghanistan, because there is no social security structure, people tend to live in their ancestral um, environments, in their own ancestral homes, because if something were to go wrong, then you have some somewhere, you have a base, and that base provides for you in terms of food and shelter and community and safety, safety in numbers. Um, so that has, that is still the case. Um, I, I would say I was, I was aware of the fact that I might be criticized for why I get to speak um, a story of Afghanistan and why I get to tell it. But I, I would say that I've tried to be as fair as I can be. And I don't claim that I am talking on behalf of the Afghan population. I've, I haven't said that. 
I have made it perfectly clear that this is my personal story, but it is one that is shared by many Afghans. And that is the feedback I get as well. Um, I have this guy who, after listening to the documentary, he said, you know, every time I hear um, an Afghan woman talk about her story um, in code, and he was, he was having an attitude as well, her story, I get really offended because they say things that are tailored to a particular audience in the West or in some part of the world. And they frame Afghanistan as if it is this woman beating, woman hating, backward primitive culture where um, you know women are just seen as a second second class citizens, blah blah blah. But when I listened to your story, I came away feeling that that was very fair. It was yes, you were you had gone through a lot, and I'm sorry, but also. I, I know so many other people who were in similar situation as you described. Um, so I didn't, I, I didn't receive criticism, no, it was far more positive and I was surprised. But then I knew that it would be positive because I actively made that effort to make sure that it is, the outcome is what would be a realistic picture in the country. And, and, and that comes from speaking to lots of people and also having a very diverse flow of information. Um, so yeah, you, you, you have both sides of the story in that documentary. You have the elite, but you also have the, the rural. I talk about, um, or maybe I haven't talked about my cousin who was shot by American soldiers and his mother lives in the countryside. Um, the same, I, I probably haven't talked about my other cousin who live in Hillmand uh, to this day. They have always lived in Hillmand and in one of the, the districts that called Marja. Marja was one of the most volatile uh, districts uh, where you know, thousands of US Marines were based. And to this day, uh, my cousins are there. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I hope it does. It absolutely does. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, no, thank you. And I said it at the beginning and again, I'll say it again at the end, close to the end, but, you know, your courage um, and resilience in reporting this subject that's both close to home and of global importance is, is really an extraordinary. Um, and I know one of the fellows had this question, but I'm just going to ask it myself. What support have you had from the BBC um, during this process? Because you've been, you know, you've been with them a long time, but again, you've really made yourself vulnerable in many ways um, in, the la in the last year. And I was wondering if you've had support from your colleagues from the newsroom over this. Mm. The BBC has um, a range of um, support available for staff. In my case, I was, uh, um, I don't know why, but I would never shared uh, anything that was personal with colleagues. Most of my close colleagues probably didn't know most of what I describe in the documentary. And again, I grew up in Afghanistan. It's a very, very tough place. Um, it's, I, when I was growing up, my mother was, would always say something like, um, if you think something is wrong, go and fix it. Don't complain. Mm -hmm. And that is the attitude I've, I've carried. So it's, I, don't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that the BBC didn't do this or that. No, the BBC has procedures in place for people who need it and who want it. Had I asked for it, I would have received um, as well. Not that I haven't, but um, I didn't feel the need that I was, um, that I need to ask for help, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, but if there is, if I ever do, then yes, they do have procedures. They do have uh, help available. Thank you. Thank you. Can I um, can I kind of pull back out to the bigger picture and especially the reporting from Afghanistan in the last year? Um, again, the international community's reporting. It was it seemed to be presented as such a shock. Um, the last days of the Afghan administration. It took everyone by surprise and journalists are not responsible for political analysts, all political analysis and the information that the White House and various prime ministers receive. But what what went so wrong and you know and from a media perspective what you know how did the story get missed for so long depends who you ask mm -hmm. if you ask 
Afghans and particularly Afghan journalists and activists and those who were involved in the society, they would say, we are not shocked. We were not shocked. We knew that the trajectory of things were going in the wrong direction. And there was a clear effort by the international community, mainly the US, to withdraw. They made a deal with the Taliban in Doha in 2020. They named it the peace deal, but it was clear from the way it was done that it was a, a withdrawal agreement. It was a retreat rather than a peace agreement. And that's what the Afghans would tell you. It was clear um, and nobody's shocked. And also the way things work is that if you, the Afghan um, uh, security forces were reliant on the international support, the international air support, uh, but also uh, ground support. Before 2014, all the operations were, um, the responsibility of the security was heavily on the shoulders of NATO forces. After 2014, after the, uh, the security handover to the Afghans, it went to the Afghans. But they still relied on the international support for, for airstrikes and other things. But once the deal was made, um, it, uh, there, were, there were mentions of the fact that uh, that support would go away from the Afghan forces, which it did. But also, if you, and again, uh, the Afghans would tell you, mostly the supporters of the previous regime or the previous government, they would tell you that if you have meetings with the Taliban almost on a weekly basis in Doha, and you treat them like a government in waiting, then why do you, why would you expect the soldiers to fight for you or to fight for anybody? Why would they fight, even if the Taliban were coming? You know, you have effectively handed over the country to them. That's what they say. Um, and, and that's what happened. When, when the day came, came and the Taliban went from district to district, there were some resistance, but in others, because the news traveled fast, the others people thought that there was no point. Uh, so then everything just, uh, there was a transition of power, so to speak, rather than uh, an active fight in, in many places. And that's what happened. And then analysts, again, if you speak to analysts, they would tell you that look at the, look at the timelines of the Afghan war or the, the US-led war in Afghanistan. From 2001 to 2021, look at the, casual, the civilian casualty figures, the security figures, the security casualty figures, as well as what was happening in society in terms of, um, you know, the social, the, the, the social and political issues, the, the crimes, the, pov the poverty, the civilian casualties. They were all pointing to a situation that was impossible. Um, to, it, it, was, it was seen that there was no other solution by the international community because, uh, you know, the, the civilian casualty figure was really high. Uh, people were dying in massive numbers. And there was a fatigue as well, even to this day. Um, you may have noticed this. You may have felt it. There is an international fatigue. There is a war fatigue. There is an aid fatigue. Um, and... Most of those things were seen to be uh, impossible to sustain. So local Africans who were really involved in, in the day-to-day -day of the things, they were not surprised by it. Um, on the international stage, yes, um, there were individuals who, who said, oh, we were shocked by the fact that this would fell to the uh, Taliban so quickly. They hadn't been watching closely. I mean, again, with the power of hindsight, you were the first person to interview Rula Khani. Um, what is your react when you saw how things ended? What was your reaction, and were you disappointed by the actions? And in, you know, what do you think about the interview when you look back at it? Yeah, the interview with the the previous first lady Rula Khani uh, was done in two thousand and fourteen because that's when um, Ashraf Ghani took over as the president in the first civil civilian and and peaceful transfer of power. It was seen. Um, and it was, uh, 
a hopeful moment for many Afghans. Uh, certainly, what from what I was following on social media and from the people that I was speaking to, they were very hopeful. Rula Ghani uh, was Lebanese. You know, she came from Lebanon. She lived in Paris in the U.S. Um, she was educated. She was visible. She was um, actively participating in events in, when she became first lady. Um, she was not like the invisible first lady that Afghans were after after President Najibullah became accustomed to. Um, so there were a lot of hopes for her. And she did do things um, that were, uh, at least for her, her supporters, were things that no any no other first lady did. So she brought in a group of strong, assertive, independent women, and she promoted them. She helped them. Um, she had them around her. But for her opponents, for those who opposed the um, the president and and the way he was working and the inner working of the palace, the presidential palace, they said they say that it was, you know, a lady who considered herself as the queen of the court, so to speak. And she only gave opportunities to those who uh, were the yes, madam, yes, sir type people who would do her work for her. So she, she, she was, she became slightly polarized after the 2014 election. Initially, there was hope, but after that, things changed. Uh, personally, I don't, I don't, I, I was there for the interview and then I came back. I don't have anything to say about that. But from what I'm hearing from her supporters and her opponents, uh, she became a controversial figure in the, at the later stages of, of um, the presidency. But some, some of her supporters do say that it's unfair to put the responsibility of such a huge country and such a complex story on one individual. She was, at the end of the day, she was a foreigner. She had married this guy and she came to this country and she was trying her best to change things. But it didn't turn out to be um, the way that most people wanted. Uh, that is according to her supporters. But for, for people who didn't like her or the, her husband, uh, she was seen as just yet another woman who was taking projects or using Afghan women to get projects and, and uh, further her interests. Yeah, there's so many parallels with first ladies in, in so many parts of the world. Um, thank you, that's why I asked. Um, just one last question, um, which is kind of really a sad question. And again, going back to the point you were making about the struggles of Afghan journalists and the fact that most Afghan journalists are going to have to now report from abroad. And we've already seen this with um, journalists from Yemen and Syria and sadly now Hong Kong. Um, Gideon, do you want to ask your question there? Gideon is from Ghana, but I think speaking for quite a lot of the group. Yeah. Yeah. So my question is uh, for journalists, particularly in Hong Kong and also in other places who are going through very difficult times. You have reported on Afghanistan remotely for a number of years. What probably advice do you have for such journalists who are forced to go into exile? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's and remote remote journalism is not really the same as as being on the ground and and um, seeing everything with your own eyes and being part of what is happening. Um, I, I don't think it's an ideal situation for most journalists. Most journalists would want to be in the story in the moment to see it, to feel it, to to hear it. But if it's impossible to, to do that, then remote journalism can provide that um, backup, so to speak, where you, you are able to do, uh, to do the work you want to do. But you have to really build relationships with people uh, because journalism is not the work of one individual. Like most, most jobs, journalism is teamwork. 
And more than that, it is, it is based on what your contributors bring to you rather than what we produce, right? It's, it's, it's about the raw material that, that you need to have. And for that, you need to have relationships um, with, with all sides of the story. I think try and not limit yourself in, in the work that you do, in the relationships that you keep. Try and check your biases as well, because sometimes it's our own biases that stops us from, from really developing those relationships that we need that is great for, for having a great story, for telling a great story. So if you are doing remote journalism, then, and then build relationships, build contacts, um, and, and be there for, you, for, for your people. Uh, those who, you know, the contributors, the, the contacts, and the people that you rely on, at the end of the day, it's, it's a two-way street. Um, give them credit where it's due, appreciate their work where you can, and um, try and recognize what they what they bring to you. Sana, thank you so much. We're kind of out of time, but I again want to thank you for coming and spending this hour with us. And I do recommend everyone listens to your documentary, which is incredibly powerful um, and a brilliant, brilliant, insightful snapshot of what's happening in Afghanistan and what, what's likely to kind of play out there. Uh, thank you also for the journalist fellows for your questions. And this is their first seminar for many of them. And thank you for everyone for, who attended as well. And we'll be back next week at the same time. But in the meantime, Sana, thank you again for your time. Thank you, Mira. Thank you for having me. Great to see you. Thank you. Just the one.